Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival and artistic director of Doc NYC. On this episode, I talk to filmmaker Sam Pollard. His latest film is Sammy Davis Jr., I Gotta Be Me. It's now playing film festivals and will be coming to PBS's American Masters in the fall. I gotta be me. I gotta be me. What else can I be but what I am? I want to live. Sammy Davis Jr. could do it all singing, dancing, acting, impersonating. He broke racial barriers throughout his career, including with Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack, but he paid a heavy price for it. Pollard's film looks at Davis in all his complexity. One flashpoint of controversy in the film occurs in the early 70s, after Davis was photographed hugging Richard Nixon. He faced an angry black audience. Disagree, if you will, with my politics. Good. Good. Good, but don't... I will not allow anyone to take away the fact that I am black. The film had its world premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival, and I interviewed Pollard at TIFF Doc Conference in front of a live audience. Pollard has been editing and directing documentaries for over 40 years. As an editor, he worked on many projects with Spike Lee, including the fiction films Mo Better Blues, Jungle Fever, and Clockers, as well as the documentary Four Little Girls. Pollard also produced Lee's two documentaries about New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. As a director, Pollard got his break in the 1980s, being hired for the civil rights series Eyes on the Prize 2. I previously covered Eyes on the Prize's creator, Henry Hampton, on episode 40. In this conversation, Pollard discusses working with both Hampton and Lee. First, I asked him about another mentor, St. Clair Bourne, who died in 2007. Bourne was a trailblazer of black documentary. Starting in the 1970s, he directed several films on historical figures, including Paul Robeson, Amiri Baraka, and Langston Hughes. This month, New York's Metrograph Cinema is holding a retrospective of Bourne's films, most of which are hard to find. I asked Pollard what St. Clair Bourne meant to him. You know, St. was uh, a towering figure for black. Literally. Yeah, towering physically, but also a towering figure in the black documentary world. And we all really looked up to him. And uh, when I was a young assistant editor, I used to see him in different you know, production, post-production centers, and I was always in awe of him, always in awe and a little frightened of him. And uh, I used to ask people, who's that guy? Who's that guy? They said, St. Clair Bourne. And uh, he used to wear these, in the wintertime, he'd wear this long leather coat, and he'd have this big leather bag on his shoulder, and he had this big, huge bracelet. Those are the things I remember about him. But about four or five years after I had sort of been introduced to him and seen him, Another colleague of mine, a gentleman named George Bowers, who had been an editor and had become a director, recommended me to Saint in 1980 to edit a film called Chicago Blues. And I spent six to eight months with Saint in the editing room as we were editing, putting the film together. And he was like a big brother to me. I looked up to him. And what he did for me was, at that time, I had sort of thought, I didn't want to get the label of being a black editor or a black filmmaker. I just want to be an editor. I just want to be a filmmaker. But spending all that time with Saint, Saint made me understand that as a person of color, as an African American, that I had a tremendous responsibility. Anytime I had an opportunity to tell our stories, that's what I should do. And so from that, from that experience with Saint, that's sort of been my prime objective, to work in films that told the stories of the African American experience. And Saint, Saint was like always there for me. You know, we used to talk two or three times a week at night He'd give me advice about films I was working on, films I, were edit- I was editing. He gave me advice when I started to be a producer at Eyes on the Prize. He's a major role model. So I was, quite honestly, when I, when he, the day he died, I was devastated. Mm-hmm. I was absolutely devastated because mm-hmm. I miss him to this day. And anytime I can speak out his name, 
that's important to me, mm. you know. Well, you mentioned Eyes on the Prize uh, that you worked on, and that was, was the second figure I wanted to ask you about is Henry Hampton, the visionary who created Black Sides, the, uh, the Boston company that produced Eyes on the Prize and uh, many other programs. I mean, that was a directing breakthrough f opportunity for you. Uh, you directed two episodes of Eyes on the Prize 2, the second series. That's right. right? Yeah. That's right. I was, it was called Two Societies, and I ain't going to shuffle no more. And Henry took a big chance on me. Uh, I had been working at this series as an editor called 321 Contact for the Children's Television Workshop in 86, 87. And the young lady who was my assistant had worked on Eyes One. And she said Henry was looking for a producer. So she gave me his number. I called him up. He invited me to come to Boston for an interview. I went up to Boston. We met. And he decided to hire me. Now, I had never produced anything, you know, so. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> he hired me, he hired me as a producer editor. I was supposed to produce and also edit. And it was, he had this unusual arrangement where we were gonna do eight shows and he had what we call these salt and pepper teams. So it would be two producers, one white, one black, and we would co-produce. One would be the lead producer of one of the shows. We had two shows each, each team. And one would be the co-producer on one show, the lead producer on one show, and one would be the lead producer on the other show. So I learned how to interview. I learned how to shoot stuff. And I realized, I used to complain all the time, these directors and producers don't know what they're doing. They, they don't ask the right questions. When you were an editor, when watching I was the an footage editor, in the room. I would say, ah, oh, these guys don't know anything. These ladies don't know anything. I'm going to show them. <laughs> So as soon as I go out in the field, as soon as I have to come up with my own questions and my own story ideas, I said, oh, this producing is hard. <laughs> <laughs> and then I get back to the editing room on the first show, and I put it together. And we had a rough cut screen of all of the first four shows. And after the rough cut screen of the show that me and Sheila Bernard, who was my co-producer, that we did, Henry called us into his office the next day, and he gave us a real tongue lashing. He said, Sam, Sheila, this show is terrible. He says, the structure doesn't work. You know, the storyline doesn't work. And Sam, the editing isn't any good. I had it feel like a knife was in my back. Whoa. And he, then he gave me this big ultimatum. He said, this is Friday. Go back to New York for the weekend and decide on Monday if you want to continue to be, in the, continue to be a producer or you just want to edit. Because maybe you can't do both. Whoa. So I had one of those come to Jesus moments. <laughs> and uh, I was agonizing all weekend. What should I do? Should I edit? Should I produce? Should I forget this producing? You know, I had never, never had anyone tell me that the editing was terrible. Mm. So that Monday, I flew back to Boston. I took a cab from Logan Airport, went to Henry's office, and I said, Henry, can you afford not to have me edit? Can we, can we afford hiring another editor? Mm. And he said, yes. So I said, I'm not going to edit anymore for this rest of the series. I'm just going to co-produce. Mm. And that's when I became a producer. Mm. That's when I came, became a producer. What did you learn on those shows? Uh, you know, can you think of anything uh, specific, figuring out a scene, or the way you, it was something you learned in the field, interviewing? Yeah. The big thing I learned in, in the, in, on working on Eyes 2 was that sometimes when you go out with a certain plan of action as the producer, those things can fall apart. Great example. We were doing a show about Muhammad Ali and how he became from, turned from being Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali and joined the Nation of Islam, and then when he refused to go to Vietnam. And we had been trying to reach out to Ali to do an interview. And we sent him letters after letter after letter, and he finally consented. So we, myself, my associate producer, the cameraman, sound person, we flew someplace outside of Michigan to his his house. He met us at the airport. He drove us. We followed him in his car to his house. We set up the cameras and the lights. And this was when he had the Parkinson's. And he didn't talk much. And we sat, I sat and interviewed Ali for about a half hour. And his answers were like one words, one words, one words. And when we got back to, the, to Boston and we started to edit that segment, and we put Ali in, it just didn't work. You know, and it was one of those big decisions I had to make, do we keep him or do we have to take him out? Yeah. And we took him out. Yeah. You know, it was like one of those things you said, it just didn't work. 
One of the other things I learned too as I was producing was that sometimes as a producer, when you, when you interview people, you gotta respect who they are. Some, you know, because I thought as a first time producer that I would have my set of questions and I would ask somebody a question and if I didn't hear the answer that I wanted, I would say, oh, could you say it like this? <laughs> you know, that's not the way I want you to say it. And I was interviewing this lady from Detroit when we, Miss Sheila and I did this show, To Society, and I tried to do that with her. And she turned to me, and she was much older than me, and she said, young man, please don't put words in my mouth. Just let me say it the way I want to say it. Mm. That was a valuable lesson for me, mm. you know. Now, sometimes it could be tricky in the editing room <laughs> right. when you're trying to put it together, but sometimes that's what you have to do. Yeah. yeah. So the third and uh, final person I want to ask you about is Spike Lee, who you edited so many films for, both fiction uh, right. and nonfiction. Right. What did it mean we, when he came along? You, you know, you'd already worked with some pretty, uh, you know, major filmmakers, but I feel like when, you know, She's Got a Habit came on the scene, Spike Lee brought, like, a, a different attitude. Revolutionary. I had seen that on the theater, in the theater on 66th Street and Broadway, and it was like revolutionary. It was so innovative. So fast forward two years later, he had done School Days, and then he had done Do the Right Thing, right? Mm. I had just saw Do the Right Thing in Boston with my now wife, and uh, I guess it was about four months later, this guy called me out of the blue, because his production manager was a buddy of mine. He was getting ready to do this jazz film, which became Mo' Better Blues. I was intrigued, you know, to work with this guy. We met up at Martha's Vineyard, and he hired me. And I have to say to you that over those 20... And did you really cut fiction before that? I had cut fiction. You had, okay. I had cut some low-budget features okay. in 1980 and 1983. I won't name the titles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I already cut fiction. I knew how to cut fiction. So the thing that was so, to me, revolutionary and challenging about Spike was that he always, you know, would try things as a director that would then, when you got in the editing room with that material, you would say, wow, I got to do something different with this stuff. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I edited Jungle Fever, he has a great scene with the women all talking about black men and their relationship with white women. Spike improv that whole sequence. He shot it with three cameras. He gave, he gave the actresses a lead line, mm -hmm. but then they were supposed to improv. And it was such a wonderful experience because it was like for me being going back to my doc editing tools, mm -hmm. having to shape this from this improvisational dialogue. And he would try those things, you know. When I did Bamboozle, he would shoot, he shot a sequence with like, he shot almost all the sequences with like six cameras. Mm -hmm. So I had the challenge of trying to figure out how to make that stuff come together, how to make that stuff come together. Spike was a guy who doesn't talk a lot, mm -hmm. but he carries a big stick, mm -hmm. you know. And he knows what he likes. He's one of the few directors that I've worked with that is never indecisive. Hmm. I don't agree all the time, hmm. but never indecisive. I'm curious what those edit room dialogues are like with him, but especially on like your, the New Orleans films that you did together where you were also uh, Very producing. Yeah. Yeah. The, I'll give you two, uh, two parallels. When Saint and I would sit in the editing room and talk and work on a film, it would be like a real good dialogue. We would talk about the shape of the film, the implications structurally, you know, what we're trying to do. With Spike, he'd come in the room, look at the cuts, says, I don't like this, I like that, change this, what about that take? I'll come back in a few days. That was it. <laughs> we never talked, we never kibitzed. You know, I edited a film for Ernest Dickerson, his longtime cinematographer, yeah. after I'd done Mo' Better Blues, and Jungle Fever, I did uh, Juice. And uh, me and Ernest would have these great dialogues, great conversations about not only the movie, but about other movies. Spike and I, in 20 years, if we had like a five minute conversation other than what was in the film, that was uh, unusual. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you had uh, a you know, very steady career um, as an editor, uh, and at, I mean, at some point in, in recent years, you started doing a lot more uh, directing. I think of uh, your film Slavery by Another Name, which Ava DuVernay is always bringing up as a real right. inspiration uh, for 13th. Right. Can you talk about what that meant for you to 
I mean, was it a conscious thing that you wanted to like, take on more directing? You know, I'm going to probably say no. I'm going to probably say that, you know, I've always sort of tried to multitask. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to edit, and I always enjoyed the process, even though sometimes it can be frustrating and challenging with other directors. But I love to edit. But then I was getting more opportunities in the last few years to direct. Mm -hmm. So I embraced them. You know, I just embraced them. I mean, when um, a friend of mine gave me the galleys to slavery by another name, I read the galleys. I said, wow, I'd love to, to direct that. Mm -hmm. And it happened. Mm -hmm. You know, when Orlando Bagwell decided to pull out of doing the film about August Wilson, mm -hmm. and he had to recommend the director, he recommended me. Mm -hmm. You know, when my buddy Ken Bowser had pitched to American Masters doing a documentary about John Ford, John Wayne, and he couldn't direct it because he was involved with another American Masters project, he recommended me. So, you know, and people started just seeing me more as a director. So. I just sort of embraced it. It wasn't a conscious decision, mm -hmm. but I embraced it, you know. And I just, you know, I, here I am in like the fourth decade of my, my career, and I still love movies. Mm -hmm. I still love documentaries. Mm -hmm. I still love the process, you know. And it's just exhilarating. I still love talking to young documentary filmmakers, aspiring documentary filmmakers, because I always say that something that Saint and Victor Konevsky and George Bowers taught me was that all this knowledge that I have is a responsibility to pass that on to another generation. Mm -hmm. Really important, because I'm not going to be here much longer, mm -hmm. you know? So it's important to see the fruits of other people's labor. Well, uh, you teach at NYU and at uh, yeah. SVA, and you, you, you know, I know many, many uh, filmmakers who have had you as a, as a teacher, and I know many other filmmakers who haven't had you as a teacher, but have called upon your expertise sure. Uh, to come into the edit room and, you know, and, and do consulting. So it, you know, clearly that's something that you have a knack for. Uh, I just love it. Yeah. And I love looking at films. I just love it. I love looking at rough assemblies, rough cuts, giving my two cents. You know? I, so in, in looking at lots of, you know, first-time filmmakers' uh, work, are there, um, are there recurring things that you feel like you should just tell every first-time filmmaker in advance? Yeah, the simple thing is trust your instincts. Trust your instincts. You know, you may be trying things that none of us have tried before conceptually and structurally, but trust your instincts. Because sometimes that makes for special work. You know, trust your instincts. That's the first thing you should do. You know, and it's always gut-wrenching to make a film. You know, it's always gut-wrenching because you have to deal as filmmakers with what? The notion that you might fail. But I always say that failure is like a pretty normal thing in life. <laughs> so embrace it, <laughs> embrace it. Because the only thing that can happen is you fail, you get right back up and do it again, you know. I've worked, I've edited a bunch of films at the first cut. I used to tell people, they used to think that just because I had a long career that people would see my first cut and say, wow, Sam, it's perfect. Never, ever happens. Mm -hmm. Never, it's never happened. That the first cut of anything I ever edited mm -hmm. was like perfect. The first thing I ever directed, the first pass assembly, never, never if anyone says, Sam, it's just brilliant. <laughs> <laughs>We'll be back with more of Sam Pollard discussing his new film on Sammy Davis Jr. after the break. If you're in New York City, please come to our weekly screening series, Stranger Than Fiction. Every Tuesday, we show a documentary at the IFC Center, followed by a conversation with the filmmaker or other special guest. Highlights of the winter season include previews of two major documentary series coming to Netflix. One is Flint Town, going inside the police department of the Michigan City convulsed by a water crisis. The other is Wild Wild Country, about a religious cult accused of crimes. We'll be previewing two episodes of each series, followed by a Q&A with the filmmakers that you won't want to miss. For more information, go to purenonfiction.net. Sam Pollard's new film, Sammy Davis Jr., I Gotta Be Me, was developed by the American Masters team at WNET. The executive producer Michael Cantor and writer Lawrence Maslin 
created a treatment that won funding from the NEH. Then they reached out to Pollard and asked if he would direct. There was no hesitation because I grew up with Sammy Davis Jr., watching him on Ed Sullivan's show in the Hollywood Palace on the Dinah Shore show, seeing him with the Rat Pack. This was a guy that I really dug, you know, and I had just come off editing for Alex Gibney, the four-hour documentary on Sinatra. Okay. So we had a whole so, section so in there about were, Sammy. You were deep into the milieu. <laughs> I was already deep into it, you know. Um, something that your film explores is that your perspective on Sammy Davis Jr. probably depends on how old you are and, you know, what part of his career you first took notice. So a point you make is that if you were just tuning into Sammy Davis Jr. in the 70s, post his embrace of Nixon and uh, when he's a kind of ubiquitous figure on uh, talk shows and singing Candyman, yeah. you probably think of him as a kind of square uh, uh, figure. Out of step. Yeah, that's Out right. Step. And, yeah. and what was your own personal perception? Well, my perception was I grew up with him in the 60s. So I remember seeing him as a 12, 13, 14-year-old on the Ed Sullivan show. I remember seeing him in Ocean's Eleven. I remember seeing him, you know, in The Man Called Adam. You know, I remember seeing him doing the Mike Douglas show. So that's the Sammy I knew, you know. The Sammy, by the time I got to be an adult in my 20s in the 70s, to me, he was a little passe. Because mm -hmm. Candyman didn't do much for me, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and uh, so it was, it was like a reacquaintance with Sammy as we got into the film, as we started to do the research and look at this huge, huge archival, you know, no. all this archival footage with just so much material. Because Sammy, Sammy Davis never said no to anything. Uh -huh. If they said, do you want to be on this show? Yes. You want to come on this show? Yes. This guy loved to be in front of an audience. He loved to perform and he loved to talk. And, the, and what's amazing about Sammy Davis Jr. is that he was always such an open guy. Drugs was just something because it seemed to be everybody was doing it and I wanted to be within with everybody. Mm -hmm. But man, to really get a nice buzz, you know, give me a little bourbon, give me a little vodka. I miss booze. See, mm -hmm. I don't miss the other stuff, mm -hmm. but I miss not drinking. And why did you stop drinking? Because my, the doctor said you're going to die. <laughs> he let himself be vulnerable. He was able to talk about himself in his ways that really... You know Sinatra didn't talk like that. Mm, Dean right. Martin didn't talk like that, but Sammy did. Right, uh, you, you, know, you have clips where, I don't know what talk show host he's uh, talking to, there, there's several different ones, but he is being like very, a lot more forthcoming <laughs> than you are used to people. Like. Very candid. Yeah. I mean, with David Frost show, with Dinah Shore, you know, he was just a candid man. He, had, he just had things to say all the time, you know? And... In some ways, he put himself on the line, you know, to hug Nixon and then realize the impact that was going to have and he, to be able to talk about it with Bill Boggs, to go to Vietnam and then to do an interview and talk about, even though he may have been getting some, getting some brickbats about it, he was going to do it, you know, the way he had to deal with his interracial marriage. This guy was a trailblazer, you know. He took the slings and arrows, but he was going to go do it his way. Like he says, he's got to be me. He had to do it his way. Yeah. It's such a complicated life. He's, he's personally complicated. He's politically uh, complicated. Um, he's a soaring talent. And you've got to tell this story in 90 minutes. Uh, yeah. Can you talk about making those choices? I mean, you could probably make a film that would cause you to really dislike Sammy Davis Jr. You could yeah. make a film that w could airbrush out, you know... Uh, all the stuff uh, that was negative. Yeah, all the negative stuff. Sure. So how did you find your way through that? You know, the decisions you have to make is what kind of film do you want to make? And I always believe that when you're doing these kind of bio, bio films, you want to try to show, show a person's comp who, who they are as complex people. You know, you want to show the, the levels of complexity. This is the one to show them being one way, you know. So that was the first thing that, you know, we had to overcome. The second thing was how to tell the story in a way that you felt that you could get as much information as you could into the film without it being overstuffed, you know. You know, you could have made a two-hour film. You could have made a three-hour film, but we knew we couldn't do that. So the important thing was, to, you know, Larry had written a script, Steve and I, Steve Wexler's out here, he was the editor on the film. 
So we looked at that script and we knew, first of all, that Larry had done a script with narration. Both of us are not big fans of narration. So the first challenge was, can we do this film without narration? First, we were both hes hesitant saying, eh, maybe not, you know. But then as we started to plow through the material, as we went through the archive, as we looked at all the stills, as we listened to his audio tapes that we had, we had, we had access to this audio he had done for his autobiography. We thought we could tell that story without, you know, falling back on narration. And then the other thing, we, as we started to assemble the film, we realized that we, were tr we wanted to try to tell it more thematically, not make it just a straight bio chronologically. So that's why when we go from his childhood, we go to his stuff as a dancer. Then we go from his stuff from a dancer to being an impressionist, then from an impressionist to being a singer. You know, we want to do it more thematically and fold in sort of the arc of his career. And that was a big challenge, how to do it, and how to do it <laughs> delicately <laughs> in a way that we weren't going to be embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it really comes off because you're, you're dealing with a performer who had uh, so many different layers of his career, and you're kind of putting that front and center. Uh, front and center. Yeah. You know, you want to see, you want to, you know, one of the things that Steve did when we were editing, he had found this great footage that we had all seen where it's, when you see the, if you've seen the film, Sammy's dancing with these two drummers and then he goes off and he sort of dances by himself. And the, the beautiful thing is to let it play. And when Steve first put it together and showed it to me and I said, you're not gonna put any voice over there? He says, I think we should just let it play. That's courageous. Mm -hmm. That's courageous filmmaking, mm -hmm. you know? And those were the kind of things that we knew throughout the film that there would be time you had to let the film breathe so you could see Sammy dance, mm -hmm. you could see Sammy sing, you could see Sammy do his imitations. Mm -hmm. you know. I want to go back to asking you about interviewing on, on this project. I wonder if you could talk to me about any interview that was you know, special to you, the preparation you went into to get that interview and what happened in the room that made it special. For me, you know, some of the interviews had been done by Michael and some others before I got there, but when I came in, I went out to LA and one of the interviews they, we had set up was Billy Crystal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has a little bungalow, which he said was the original bungalow for Clark Gable and Vivian Lee from Gone with the Wind, right? And he had turned into his office. Mm -hmm. So we walk in with the crew and he seemed very serious, you know? And I said, oh man, is he in a bad mood? Is he, I hope he, hope he, hope he opens up. Mm -hmm. We set up the cameras, camera, we set up the lights, and then Billy comes in and sits down, we mic him up. And as soon as I ask him the first question, he just turns it on. He's a performer. Mm -hmm. He just lights it up, you know? And one of the things I've learned over the years as an interviewer is I try not to make it feel like an interview, but more like a conversation. Because mm -hmm. if you make it feel like a conversation, the people, they give you more, mm -hmm. you know? And Billy was good. And when we got Whoopi, we were told we would only have 20 minutes with her because she was just finishing up The View. And she came into the green room, she sat down, and she was in a great mood, great mood. And we sat down with her, and she gave us 30, 35 minutes. Mm. And she was warm, as you can see. She said some beautiful things about Sammy, beautiful things. So that's the yeah. thing you want. You want people to, to feel comfortable talking about someone they feel special about. Sounds like you also want professional comedians. So. <laughs> I do. Because <laughs> they're good. <laughs> really elevates Professional it. comedian self. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've taken on the subjects that you've talked about, some of which are things that came to you, uh, whether it's August Wilson or, or, or John Ford. Um, what are the things that you'd like to be doing now? Well, as I was telling you in the, in the green room, I'm trying to get a film off the ground about the wonderful jazz percussionist drummer, Max Roach. Mm -hmm. I've been working on it for a while. And uh, I had shot a lot of footage of him about 20 years ago, which I was really sort of the first stuff I directed. And I didn't like, I didn't like watching it, but another filmmaker has persuaded me to go back into that material. And now we're trying to just ratchet it up to get some money, to get some funding, to shoot it, to get the family on board, to, to help us with the archives. So that's a film that's close to my heart that I really want to do. Because you know? you're a big jazz fan. Yeah, I'm a big, big jazz fan. And I spent a lot of time with Max in the 90s, so it'd be really, really, really great for me to do a film like that. I want to thank Sam Pollard 
for joining me at TIFF Doc Conference. His latest film, Sammy Davis Jr., I Gotta Be Me, is now playing at film festivals and coming to American Masters in the fall. Thanks to our team, TIFF Doc Conference producer, Dorota Leck. Pure Nonfiction Series producer, Sarah Modo. Sound mixer, Tom Micah. And web designer, Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at THOM Powers. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.